great to see everyone. Um, I mentioned yesterday I had some copies of a book that Dad wrote that we still have boxes and boxes of, and noticed that supply was gone, so I have restocked that if anyone was still interested and, and wasn't able to get a copy. Uh, appreciate. I, I feel so blessed and, and humbled to share uh, with you, and, and I've really appreciated the, the stories that we've started with each morning, and, and uh, Bob and Chris and Tom uh, sharing their personal stories, and I, I think about, you know, I said a word about testimonies the other day, but I think also what, I think, believe it's in First Thessalonians where Paul says he was delighted to share the gospel, but also our lives as well. And sometimes we neglect that in the evangelistic process that it's, it's sharing the gospel. We're certainly sharing the gospel, but we're also sharing what God has done in our lives and how he's rescued us and, and providentially worked in our lives. And, and that's very inspiring to people. It's inspiring to me uh, to hear those things. Just a reminder that uh, just as God is at work in the pages of the Bible in these ancient words, he's, he's still at work in people's lives today and, and certainly at work in, in your lives. If you haven't noticed, each uh, title, the titles of all of these lessons are taken from uh, titles of hymns. And so I, I know our, our big theme this week is Ancient Words, which that's a more modern song. I love that, that uh, beautiful song that we've sung every day uh, this week, Ancient Words. Uh, the other titles, the individual lesson titles, are, are taken from hymns, and I appreciate that our song leaders have, have led those during our devotional times uh, each morning. But on Monday, uh, our theme was Give Me the Bible, and we spent some time in 2 Timothy 3 speaking about the designation of the Bible. It's called Scripture there in that passage, talking about the inspiration of the Bible. It is God-breathed, also the application of Scripture. Yesterday's message, Standing on the Promises, we started talking about the really big story of, of the Bible, from creation to new creation. And we sure shared the first three acts of this, that it's, it starts out with creation, uh, moves on to the fall, uh, to, to the crisis, and then to covenants, and, and the promises that are contained in those covenants. Today's lesson, Tell Me the Story. We're going to continue that path that we started yesterday, with the next three acts in the divine drama, we're going to talk about Christ, we're going to talk about the church, we're going to talk about consummation or new creation. And then tomorrow, we're going, tomorrow morning, last thing before uh, everyone leaves, we're going to close this series out with a lesson entitled, Wonderful Words of Life. And talk about the application of scripture. What does it mean to live into this big story? And, and how do we go from being just hearers of the word to being doers of the word? So again, I appreciate your participation and and kindness and inviting me to be with you this week. When we, did, when we sing that, sto that song, Tell Me the Story, as we did this morning during our devotional hour, uh, we're acknowledging the truth that we're speaking of, that, that we have a story to tell. It's God's story, but, but we have a, a part and a place in it, and, and the story centers around Jesus. He's the hero of the story. He's at the, the apex, the, the zenith of the story. Everything, everything in the Bible is either leading to him or flowing from him. Back in 1999, the television show Seinfeld went off the air. How many of you remember Seinfeld? So, of course, you could still see it in syndication and reruns, but that was the last new episode was in 1999. And that show became a, a staple of popular culture. Uh, talented writers and actors uh, made it so, but there was something else at work. There was something that, that resonated with people besides just the humor of that show. The, the show billed itself as a show about nothing. And you say, well, a lot of shows are a show about nothing, that, and that's true. But this show actually prided itself in being a show about nothing. If you ask the writers, if you ask the director, what's your show about? They would have said, well, our show is a show about nothing. And it was really true because when you examine the lives of the characters of that show, the central characters of the show lived without any basic commitments. They shied away from long-term relationships and fidelity. Uh, whenever they came close to deepening in a relationship, they would back away from that. And, and we might wonder, well, how is it that a show about such self-absorbed individuals could become a cultural phenomenon? But that show about nothing spoke to a postmodern audience that doesn't have themselves a larger story to make sense of their lives. See, we live in a time when we tell stories about not having a story. Uh, if we don't have a story to fit our lives into, then we become a people and a culture that live without basic commitments, that shy away from long-term relationships, that avoid deepening relationships, and tend to live just for self and for our own desires and our own pleasures. And the loss of a unifying story will do that to people. 
And so when we talk about the Bible, we understand that in these ancient words, there's all types of literature in the Bible. We might call these, uh, your English professors might call this genres. There are different genres in the Bible. And so in the Bible, you will find poetry, uh, you'll find history, you'll find apocalyptic literature. There are different types of, of writings in the Bible, legal materials, similar to what you would find in a law book or constitution. However, all of those genres, all of those types of literature come under the larger framework of, of narrative. Uh, the Bible is a story. Now, not, again, not in a fictional sense, not a fictional story, but one unifying story that from, goes from Genesis 1, verse 1, to Revelation chapter 22, verse 21, from creation to new creation. And uh, within that grand story, there are smaller stories that, that uh, comprise that larger story, and they intersect with one another, and they tell us uh, more and inform us more about what God is doing in that larger narrative, that larger story. But we know these Bible stories, we know them pretty well. We learned them as children. Great Bible class in, in this room yesterday about the importance of teaching our children. And many of us were blessed to grow up going to Sunday school and, and learn those stories from an early age. And we know them so well that if I were to start a, a phrase or a sentence, you could finish it for me. And in fact, we're going to do that here just as an exercise. So I'm going to say just a, a name or a phrase, and I just want you to say out loud the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, so Noah and the... Good. Uh, Cain and... Daniel and the... David and... Okay. Who said Bathsheba? I don't, what, I don't, know, I don't know about this group. Now, we know, we know these stories, and so we know there's something that comes to mind right when we hear those, those words and those names, and these stories have helped to shape and to form our values. They, they teach us obedience. They teach us faithfulness. They, they teach us courage. Sometimes they teach us what not to do. And so turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And look at the first 11 verses of the 10th chapter of the letter to uh, Corinthians. First letter to the Corinthians. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and they passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. And they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And notice verse 6. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, these people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. And so we know this Corinthian letter was written to a, a troubled church. And we know some of the things that were going on in first century Corinth. There was uh, infighting and division and factions had developed and brothers were suing other brothers in court. They were very litigious and... There was immorality that was being practiced in this church, and not only practiced in this church, but overlooked and even tolerated by other church members, and there were abuses of the Lord's Supper. And in that context, Paul refers back to the story of ancient Israel, the story that we spoke about yesterday, and how the Israelites witnessed the mighty acts of God. They saw the, the parting of the Red Sea. They experienced the provisions in the, in the wilderness. And in spite of all that, they practiced idolatry. In spite of all that, they were disobedient. And, and Paul draw, draws a straight line between those Old Testament occurrences and current conditions in, in Corinth. And Paul says, don't be like that. Learn your history. We know the saying, uh, those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. And so Paul says, you remember your, your history. And it is just another example of the importance of being connected to a larger story. And for some reason, we think we age out of Bible stories. And so sometimes we, we get the impression that you know, we go to Sunday school or we go to Bible hour, and that's where we learn about David and Goliath and Daniel and the lion's den. But then we come to big church. And then we could talk about doctrine and theology and, and some of the weightier things. Stories are still important. In fact, Jesus thought stories were pretty important because he told a lot of them in his ministry uh, to convey deep truths. Uh, here's the power of, of these stories. Stories are like mirrors in which we see ourselves. 
And so when an Israelite father told his son a story, he would say something like, we were slaves in Egypt. And he might be talking to his son who wasn't even born, who didn't even live himself in slavery, but that's the way the father phrases it. That's the way he tells the story. We were slaves in Egypt. Our people, this, this is our story. You're a part, you're coming in, you're part of this story. Uh, God gives us his word in narrative story form so that we could find ourselves in it. We could see our lives reflected in the personalities of the Bible and be challenged by that. Uh, stories are memorable. Uh, stories stick in our minds better than propositional truths or indicative statements. And I, I've certainly witnessed this in preaching. Uh, people will, will remember the stories that you tell. In fact, uh, one of the couples uh, has come up to me since I've been here and mentioned that they were passing through northwest Arkansas here about uh, eight or ten years ago and heard me preach then. And they remembered one of the stories that I told that Sunday morning. And so people remember stories, and, and we want them to remember the, the point that's attached to those stories, but uh, often we remember stories. They're, they're memorable. I think that's why Jesus told so many in his ministry. And, and it's interesting how often we reference these, even in everyday conversation, and people immediately know what it is that we're talking about. And so uh, if I were to say to you or say to anyone that such and such person has the patience of Job, we know we can recall the story of Job. And, and sometimes even people, we can even hear that phrase sometimes in secular context. And, and someone who doesn't even go to church, they often will know what you're talking about because just the process of cultural osmosis, uh, they've heard that story, they attended Sunday school back in their childhood, whatever, but they know what it is that you're referencing when you say that. If I ask, am I my brother's keeper? Well, you know the story that that comes from. Uh, you know if someone calls you a Judas or calls you a Jezebel, you know they're not paying you a compliment because we're familiar with those stories as well. And so uh, these stories have become such a part of our lives that we connect other areas to our lives to them. And it helps us to make sense and, and have a point of reference for some of the things that we experience in, in our lives. Uh, stories are, in, uh, are, a, are a source of encouragement. Uh, turn over to Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51. So just consider... Uh, Israel, when Israel went into exile, they wondered if God had abandoned them. We might feel the same way uh, in that circumstance. And notice how the prophet Isaiah encourages the exiles. Isaiah 51, verses 1 through 3. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of, of singing. And so Isaiah is telling the people, remember your story. You're children of Abraham. Now, he doesn't go into great detail about the story of Abraham here. He, just has to, he only has to mention Abraham and Sarah's names, and he knows that people are going to connect with that larger story and, and know the details of that story, how God promised Abraham or gave, delivered Abraham and Sarah a son when they were well past age. Uh, this long history that, that started with Abraham goes through the, 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 uh, the conquest and the monarchy. And, and God has done so many mighty things in for his people in the past, and if he's done those things in the past, he could do them again. And so take heart, be encouraged by that. Um, I, not having been around you all for uh, any longer than, than this week, uh, I don't know the challenges that are being faced and confronting each one of you, but I know in a room this large that some of you are facing some really immense challenges. Uh, you're heartbroken because of a strained family relationship. You might be grieving right now the, the loss of a loved one or grieving someone who's far from the Lord. Uh, you might have concerns about your health. But whatever your situation, whatever your circumstance, even not knowing what that is, I could promise you that there's some story in the Bible that you will connect to and it will speak to you. Uh, those ancient words, ever true, changing me, changing you, they, speak, they continue to speak to our lives today. And then also the, the Christian story in particular transforms our values and submits, uh, or subverts, I'm sorry, subverts the stories of our culture. And again, this is one of the reasons why we really need to be in the Word. Mike was just sharing with me about how this theme was kind of birthed in his mind was during COVID and just how much encouragement from being in the Word of God during a time of social isolation. 
And, and we need that. We need that time in the Word. Because if we're only exposed to the stories that the world tells, it's going to negatively impact our values. And so whether we want to admit it or not, if we're only listening to the world's stories, what, whatever medium that is, if it's movies, if it's television, books, what, whatever, uh, we're going to end up with worldly values, if those are the only stories that we're he hearing. And uh, whether I consciously adopt those or not, it's, a, it's that garbage in, garbage out concept. Now, conversely, what happens when I feed myself a steady diet of the Word of God? Uh, that's going to strengthen, that's going to, to bolster my, my values, sharpen me. Uh, the people of the Hamar tribe in northeast India were once fierce headhunters. And, and their cult, they had a culture of violence, and it just cycled through the generation. Every, every generation was more violent than the one that came before it. Well... In 1910, there was a Welsh missionary named Watkin Roberts, and he sent a, co a copy of the Gospel of John to the, to the Hamar chief, and, the chief and translated it into his own native tongue. And the Hamar chief began to read the Gospel, and it sparked something within him, and he extended an invitation to Watkin Roberts to come and visit him and his tribe. Now, how many of us would accept an invitation to go visit a tribe of headhunters? I saw the signs over on the, in the lodge. I saw the signs in the lodge. I don't think anyone was, any of those places uh, have headhunters. But he accepted the invitation. He goes, he talks to the chief, converts him to Christ. Within two generations, the entire tribe has converted to Christianity. And that's the power of a story, the gospel story, to transform values. I, I believe that could happen in our culture, but it has to start with us. And so let's continue down the path that we started on yesterday, talking about the big stories. And so uh, I showed you this yesterday, that uh, this is kind of the, uh, the, the pattern of all good stories. There, there's exposition, the stage is set, characters are introduced, there's rising action. This is the time when uh, conflict is introduced. Uh, sometimes new characters come on the scene, some characters die off, they, they come on stage. And then there's a climax, or some climatic event that happens that's at the center of the story. And uh, then after that, the falling action, which is basically the implications of this climax. And then any good story has resolution. Often we, we judge stories, whether they're good stories or bad stories, by the ending. Was it a good ending? Was it a bad ending? And, and we make our judgment based on that. And so yesterday, uh, we talked about the first three acts, creation. Uh, the Bible begins, as all good stories do, at the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so the first verse of the Bible sets the stage for us. Uh, by the third chapter of the Bible, there's already a crisis. Sin enters the world. Adam and Eve are tempted by Satan. They do the one thing they're commanded not to do. They eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and that opens the floodgates. Next generation, brother kills brother. Population grows, and they're building a tower as a monument uh, to themselves. And just we, we see that, that sin just continue to, to increase and occur on the earth. And we start reading about mur murder and jealousy and pride and hubris and, and all of these sins. But God is faithful even when we are faithless. And throughout the Old Testament, God makes a series of covenants with his people. Uh, covenants that display his grace and his faithfulness. And yet, again and again, people turn to obstinance and, and to disobedience. And nevertheless, the Old Testament keeps pointing ahead to a new and better day and the fulfillment of all God's promises. The Lord's anointed, the Messiah, is going to come. Listen to these words. I didn't share this passage yesterday, but Isaiah 9. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be call, called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the greatness of his government government and peace there will be no end he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever but the Old Testament closes with a cliffhanger it doesn't present itself as a finished narrative if you were <coughs> reading the Old Testament simply as you read a, a, a novel uh, you would get to Malachi last Malachi 4 last chapter of the Old Testament and you would read the last words and you would think, well, where's the rest of the story? What, what comes next? What happens? There has to be a sequel. There has to be something that, that follows this. Well, there's a 400-year gap between the time of the Old Testament and the time of, of the New Testament. A lot happens during that time. I'm not going to cover all of that. But at the close of the Old Testament, Persia is the dominant empire. Uh, Rome is on the scene when we open in the New Testament. But it's not a direct handoff between those those two. There's a lot of things that, that happen in between uh, the time of Alexander the Great, the rise of Greece, the Maccabean Revolt. Uh, the Jews make a treaty of Rome, and, and that, it's that Roman world that Jesus is born into. 
And so in Luke's gospel, this fourth, fourth act, though it's about Jesus, it doesn't start with Jesus. Actually, in Luke, it starts with John the Baptist, a relative of Jesus. First prophetic voice that's been heard in 400 years. And so he breaks that long period of silence. And what's John's message? Repent, change, turn to God. Why? Because the kingdom is near. It's breaking in. It's so close you can reach out and, and, and touch it. it. It's here now. When he sees Jesus, he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But don't think that John didn't have his doubts. Because John, as he was in prison before being beheaded and killed, sent his disciples to ask. You know, Jesus, I said you were the Lamb of God. I preached it. I taught it. I, I really believe that. But I just got to know, are you really the guy? Are you really the one? And so John's been preaching that, but he just wants to verify, is this the promised descendant of Abraham? Is this the one who's going to, to rule over the Davidic kingdom? Is this the serpent crusher? And Jesus sends word back. He, he says, you just tell them what you've seen and heard. You tell them about the miracles and the exorcisms and the healings. And you tell them to take heart. You tell them to take heart. John the Baptist gives way to Jesus. Jesus' ministry starts when he's about 30 years old. We really don't read much about Jesus before that. We have the birth narratives. We know the events surrounding his birth. One episode when he was 12 years old. We read about that in the Gospels. Most of what we know about Jesus is a three-year period between the age of 30 and the age of 33. And how did Jesus present himself to people during that time? How did people come to faith in Jesus? Well, uh, it was in a number of ways. Uh, it was through uh, personal interaction. I'm just going to put all these up at one time. It was through personal interactions. It was through scripture. It was through miracles. It was through preaching and teaching. And so uh, the personal interaction, the Samaritan woman, uh, she has a personal encounter with Jesus, changes her. She becomes a, a believer and tells others. Uh, scripture, uh, some would say, uh, hey, we've listened to this guy. We believe that he's the fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. The miracles. Remember what Nicodemus said to Jesus? He says, we know you're from God. No one can do the things you're doing if he wasn't from God. And so the miracles convince some people. And, and then obviously preaching and teaching. Uh, after the Sermon on the Mount, people were amazed at Jesus because he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. And so how do people come to faith today? Well, in, in very similar ways to, to these, go ahead and put that back up on there for a moment. Uh, we come to faith today in, in very similar ways to these that we just mentioned. Uh, personal interactions, not, not with a fleshly Jesus, but People come to faith because they interact, just as some of the stories have illustrated, the testimonies have illustrated this week. Uh, our brothers have come into contact with people who had an impact on their lives. And so those personal interactions matter. Uh, scripture, I, I know people who have read the Bible and have come away saying, I need to be baptized. I need to become a Christian. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, miracles, I don't believe we live in an, an age of miracles such as what existed in the first century. But I do believe that people see God's intervention and action in their life, and sometimes that is what leads them to faith because they know that God's active and working in this world. And then as a preacher, I still like to believe that preaching and teaching has an impact, that it makes a difference, that people hear the proclamation of God's truth and come to saving faith, uh, not because we have any authority on our own, but because we're preaching from an authoritative source. And so Jesus had this multifaceted ministry where he's announcing the kingdom, he's calling people to turn from their sins, to be back in a right relationship with God, and he's making these very, very bold claims. He's claiming to be the Son of God. He's claiming to be God in the flesh. He's claiming to be himself the fulfillment of all of the, the, the scriptures uh, from the Old Testament. But as Jesus' popularity grows, so does opposition to Jesus. Religious leaders uh, plot to eliminate, kill Jesus because he threatens the status quo, their way of life. Around the same time, Jesus starts telling his followers that he is going to suffer and die at the hands of religious leaders, but three days later he'll rise again. Now, Jesus is very clear in telling them that, but it, just, it doesn't always compute. And so for him to talk about a suffering Messiah, that's oxymoronic. That just doesn't, a Messiah, a, a, an anointed king who's going to suffer, those two things don't, don't match up. Those two things don't go together. But we come to the climax, the true climax of the story, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Everything comes to a head when Jesus visits Jerusalem one Passover. While he's there, he's arrested, he's beaten, he's sentenced to be crucified as some sort of political revolutionary. But what they mean for evil, God means for good. And through his death on the cross, Jesus pays the penalty, pays the price for our sins and punishment that we deserve, lands full force on him. 
and he dies in our place. And the Old Testament passage that is most quoted, most referenced, most referred to in, in the New Testament is Isaiah chapter 53. Here's some of what it says. Surely he took our pain, bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds we were healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has gone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But you and I know the story doesn't end with Jesus' death. Jesus is resurrected. Three days later, he comes out of the tomb, defeating the devil and death itself. And the resurrection shows us that God has started this process of making all things new. That the curse is now being reversed. And it's not time for the new heavens and new earth, but it's getting closer. There's a Shakespearean actor named Alec McGovern, uh, McGowan, I'm sorry, who performs a one-act play based on the Gospel of Mark all over the English-speaking world. No props. Dialogue comes straight from the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, audiences love it. Even people who don't, aren't acquainted with the Bible love it. And he says, the questions he gets most frequently, people will ask, did you write that? And some people will say, where can I get a copy of the script? And he says his answer to that is, he says you can find one in just about any hotel room. You can find a copy of the script. Well, Jesus spends 40 days after the resurrection. That's such a compelling story. Jesus spends 40 days after the resurrection teaching his disciples about the kingdom uh, preparing them for their coming mission, but they have to wait in Jerusalem until God sends the Holy Spirit to empower them for that mission. And Jesus ascends to the right hand of God where he still is waiting for a day when he will return and the curtain falls on Act 4 and now it's time for the falling action of the Bible. Amen. So in Act 2 we learn about the day of Pentecost. Thousands of Jews from all over the Mediterranean world have gathered in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit comes powerfully on the disciples, just as Jesus said that he would. Peter, who had denied Jesus before his crucifixion, is the one to preach the stirring, rousing gospel sermon. He himself, having been restored by Jesus, 3,000 people turn from their sins and are baptized that day. We had, when I was a missionary in South America, we had one day where we had, I think, five or six baptisms on the same day. They, it wasn't a family. They weren't related. It was just various people that we had studied with, and we thought, this is powerful. The Spirit is moving. And it was powerful, and the Spirit was moving, but we've never seen anything like the day of Pentecost. And just imagine what it was like to see 3,000 people baptized on, on a single day. That's just another level. And these new followers of Jesus, they form a new community, sharing a common life that shows that they're the true people of God. And this church is the new Israel, not just, made, not just comprised of Jews, not those who have the DNA of Abraham. Now, uh, not, at least not phys, phys, lot, physiologically, they don't have the DNA of Abraham. Spiritually, though, they have the faith of Abraham. And Abraham's the father of us all, all who believe, Jew and Gentile. And Jesus, again, Jesus had told his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And I always picture these verses as concentric circles. That the inner circle is Jerusalem. That was where the gospel was first preached on the day of Pentecost. Judea, the region in which Jerusalem is located, the bordering region of Samaria to the ends of the earth. That's the progression of the gospel that we read about in the, in the book of Acts. And again, kind of provides the outline for the book of Acts uh, as we see that progression. Uh, Peter is the one who's most central in the first half of, of Acts. He's an apostle to the Jews. The gospel goes first to the Jew. Uh, Paul was converted. He becomes most central, the most central character in the second half of the book of Acts as the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul was uniquely qualified. Paul was a Jew trained under Rabbi Gamaliel. Uh, he knows very well the first half of the story that we talked about yesterday. He knows it very well. Uh, but he was born in Tarshish, a, a free Roman city. And so he had Roman citizenship, unlike Jesus, unlike Peter. Uh, he could go places they couldn't go. He had privileges afforded to him that weren't afforded to them. He knew the language and the culture and the poetry of the Gentile world. And so while Paul is on this, these various missionary journeys, we might call them preaching tours, uh, he's writing letters. He's writing, we call them epistles. And so he's writing letters to, back to the churches that he worked with or established. Uh, he's not the only letter writer. It's not just letters of Paul we have in our New Testament. 
Uh, James and Jude, half-brothers of Jesus, they wrote letters. Peter and John, apostles, wrote letters. Someone wrote Hebrews. We'll know one day who wrote the book of Hebrews. But these writers are pointing back to the central event. They're pointing back to the climax. They're speaking of the resurrection and instructing churches, this is how you live the resurrected life. And and Paul often in his writings is saying things like, you were baptized, you were enlisted in the resurrection story. Don't you remember that? Now, a lot of the passages we have about baptism, they weren't written to people who weren't baptized, convincing them to be baptized. Now, I know in our evangelistic efforts, we, we show those to people, and I think that's, that's good. We need to do that. But the passages we have in the Bible about baptism were mostly written to people who had already been baptized to be reminded, hey, remember what you signed up for. Remember the story that you enlisted in. And you need to live that out in, in your own personal life. And so these letters that we have in the New Testament, these are more than just instruction manuals that tell us how to organize a church or hold a Sunday morning assembly. Now, that that, that stuff's important, and and the letters inform us of some of those things, but they have a much larger purpose than that. These are the connective tissue to the really big story, telling us the implication of that story in our lives. And so Peter says it this way in 1 Peter chapter 1. Or 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm sorry, verses 9 and 10. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, God's a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And if these words sound a little bit familiar, it's because we had very similar words on the screen yesterday. Words delivered by Moses from God at the foot of Mount Sinai where the people were called a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Here's another thing, important thing, though, about this fifth act in the divine drama. You realize we're on the stage now. This story is still going on. It's, it hasn't been complete. It hasn't reached its conclusion yet. And we're, we're on the stage right now. I, I had a friend who would preach a sermon, and when he got to the end of his sermon, he would in, instruct everyone to turn to Acts chapter 29. And you would hear Bibles opening and people uh, rifling through their, their pages. And, and then you would hear chuckles and groans because everyone would realize, okay, there's not an Acts chapter 29. There's only 28 chapters in Acts. But in a sense, there is. We're, we are Acts 29. Uh, this story, the expansion of the gospel, that, that's still going on. This is, uh, this is our part of the story. and It's still being written. We're still on mission. And we're waiting for the conclusion. We're waiting for the consummation of the story. And when it, the time comes for God to finally consummate all that he's promised, it's going to take our breath away. Because Christ will return in glory. There's going to be a new heavens and new earth that Isaiah prophesied about, Peter and John spoke of. God will again dwell among his people. And at the conclusion in the New Testament, we read Revelation 21. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling is now among his people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And then in Revelation 22, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life. Notice the symmetry of the Bible. It ends right where it began tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are from the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. That's been repealed. That's been reversed. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Transform creation, God dwelling among his people, sins completely forgiven, people serving and worshiping, unhindered, a redeemed humanity. That's our destiny. That's the conclusion. That's how this great story ends. And that reality should transform everything about our lives now. It changes how we think. It changes the things that we desire. It changes what we do and how we relate to God and others. It changes how we spend our retirement years. A story that touches every aspect of our lives. And so when, when my youngest daughter Kylie was in elementary school, we, we took a, they took a field trip to Crystal Bridges Museum, a 
a world-renowned art museum in our area. And I was one of the chaperones for the trip. So I, I went with the kids and had an excellent tour guide who took us through the main gallery and we didn't stop, not nearly enough time to stop at every exhibit, but she just had a few that she had selected that she would stop at. And I, I remember, I really appreciated the tour guide and her approach to teaching the kids about art. And I remember one painting in particular that we stopped at and it looked to be a frontier era scene, something out of the 1800s, and it was, it was winter time, and you saw a, a cabin built beside a quiet stream, and there was a man out chopping wood, probably about 100 yards from, from the cabin. Uh, but again, the, the way the tour guide presented this to the kids was what fascinated me. She didn't describe the painting to them. She just asked them questions. And so she said, for example, okay, you see the man in the painting. Do you think he has any neighbors? And the kids are looking at this painting, and it's pretty expansive. You see a lot of wooded area, and they say, well, you know, if he does have any neighbors, they don't live very close to him. Okay, good. So uh, do you think he lives alone? And the kids are kind of looking at the painting, and there's this cabin. There's a little bit of light emanating from the cabin, and so they think that makes them think, well, maybe there's somebody still in there while he's out chopping wood. So maybe he has a, it's a tiny cabin, though, so maybe it's a small family, just a wife, child. So he probably has family. What do you think he does for food? Well, he can't go to Kroger, he can't go to Walmart, so what does he do for food? Well, there's a stream there, maybe he fishes in that stream. There's woods, probably he goes hunting in the woods. And the kids are really good about kind of trying to picture all of this. And the tour guide asks, well, he's, he's chopping a tree. What, what happens if the axe slips? What happens if he injures himself? Can he call 911? Now, who's going to take him to the hospital? Is there a hospital? And so the kids are kind of working through, and you see the, the wheels turning about. And, and see, what the tour guide is doing is getting them to step inside the story. She's not teaching art by t telling them about colorization and about scale. She's saying, I, we, I want you to see the, the story that's being painted by, by the artist and step into that. And, and I use that as an illustration to kind of speak to the, the approach that We've been talking about the last couple of days about scripture. You know, we could take an academic approach to scripture where we look at the Bible. Or we could take an involved approach to scripture where we stand within the Bible. Now, understand, those two aren't, mutu aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. And so uh, I was trained, you know, I have Bible degrees, and so I was trained in an academic approach. And I, I know my way around commentaries and concordances and can do exegesis and word studies and and, and those things are useful, but they're only useful in as much as they get us to involve ourselves within the story. Sometimes we could uh, dissect and atomize the Bible so much and not ever really be enlisted ourselves in the story that the Bible tells. And so, and, and when we do that, we're missing the richness of it. And so Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. They were very studious. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, and yet you refuse to come to me to have life. It, they were missing the one who was the hero of the story. And so let's locate ourselves in the larger story, the big story of, of God's plan, what God uh, has started and what he continues to do in this world. Let's find our significance and our meaning by connecting, by bringing our lives into God's story. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for the time that we've had together this morning. Father, we just... Uh, and what a great day to hear personal stories of, of uh, the ways that you are continuing to work. Father, we know that we're, we're on the stage right now, that, that this is our part in the, the drama that's still being written. And uh, Father, we know because your promises are true that you're going to bring it all to a glorious conclusion. And Father, we don't want to live our lives just for now. We want to live our lives in light of eternity. And so Father, I'm thankful for the example of these sojourners who uh, continue in your service in, the, in their retirement years. Father, I pray for our churches back home. Father, I pray for their faithfulness, for their obedience. Father, I pray for us as we go through uh, the remainder of, of our short re remaining time that we have uh, in this workshop. Father, bless our time together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.